This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. Uh, every week we interview a film professional to discuss their work, and this week I'm joined by sound designer Peter Albrexen, uh, who recently designed the sound for Evil Dead Rise. Uh, welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you so much. I guess my first question for you is, how did you get involved with this project? The director, um, Lee Cronin, is Irish, and um, he um, his one of his best friends is an Irish sound designer who recommended me for this job and then Lee reached out to me and um, just from the first time that we were talking it was just like we were so much in sync and we, like the way that Lee is incredibly passionate about sound and um, we just had this kind of like affinity like this feeling that there was this close connection and um, a lot of the same kind of like qualities and the way that we were both, I mean, in love with sound as a storyteller, it just like, it just felt like we were, I mean, closely connected from the very beginning. I got into sound designing at a point when things were just developing. I was really fascinated by the idea that dialogue, effects, and music were all components of the soundtrack to a film, which had never occurred to me before. What gets me excited is coming up with sound ideas that do match picture, but also is not just the equivalent of what you're seeing on screen. I'm Eugene Garrity, and this is my course on sound design. Well, it's, it's interesting because I like when I watched this, it felt very much like the sound um, is almost uh, playing a part in the storytelling or is like utilized as a storytelling tool. So I'm wondering, how did you work with the editing team to, uh, you know, make sure that they had the tools so that the sound was ready for you? I mean, it was incredible just from the first time I read the script, read Lee's script. Lee was also the script writer. There was so much sound written into the script. I don't think I ever experienced a script with so much sound written into it. And not just like small descriptive details, but where the sound is actually a part of the storytelling. The, the actual like the actual storytelling happens through the sound. So um, it was really evident that I needed to be part of the process from very early on. So when the picture editing started, then I started doing sound. I mean, we pretty much started up all at the same time, Lee and the picture editor, Brian Shaw and me. And they started out in New Zealand where they were shooting the film. And then they moved to Ireland where uh, Lee is based. And I was working from here in Copenhagen, my studio here in Copenhagen. And then we sent sketches back and forth all the time and had lots of Zoom meetings and all these. Um, and um, then I think four months, after four months of that, then I came to Ireland for a couple of months. And then we finished up doing two months of mixing in Dolby Atmos here in, here in Copenhagen. So it was eight months for me all in all. You know, I, I want to know, uh, because designing horror sounds is, are pro is probably a pretty fun thing to do. So how did you approach design designing some of these gore sounds and sort of scary, gross sounds? I mean, it's so much fun because sound is such a, like, such a big part of horror. I mean, like, if, if you don't want to be scared of a horror film, you shouldn't really, like, hold like your fingers in front of your eyes, you should hold them in your ears because so much of the horror comes from the sound. Um, so it was a lot of fun. It was um, 
because there was so much sound written into the script, then already when I read the script, it's, it was almost like a grocery list of all these things I needed to record and get hold of, all these different sounds that was needed to tell the story. And um, then, I mean, we just started going. There were so many sequences where, like, where sound was such an important thing. And, um, and the thing when, like, doing these gross things, like these bloody, bloody... <laughs> <laughs> grew some sounds. A lot of that is actually sounds of vegetables and fruits and like like we found out mandarins had a really nice sound for like splatty stuff and there's this classic things classic thing of using celery for broken bones <laughs> stuff like that. But then also on top of that, I mean, on top of all the classic gross sounds in this film, there was so much, like, just weird, crazy, abstract sounds going on all the time to create this new supernatural feeling. And um, a lot of that was built on all kinds of recordings that we did. I really like going out and recording lots and lots and lots and lots of sounds and then manipulating manipulating them in all kinds of weird ways. So, I mean, a scene like the headbutt on the door, which is something that's quite simple in a way. It's just like the ghost like the, or the demon kind of like Ellie hitting like her head into the door. Something like that was then, I mean, I took, I, 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 I did a recording of just me hammering on a door, but then I used a plugin to kind of like make other sounds sound like a, 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 some, something hitting a door. So I used a train sound, I used hand grenades, I used like subharmonic distortion, I used all these kind of different elements that because they're all organic, they have this kind of real feeling to them, but in a way it's so like unreal in a way, but it just feels very gritty and very real. And that was important for us to kind of get that feeling of really being there in this tiny apartment with these characters that just got molested. Now you brought up the tiny apartment, but I do have one question first. How did you do the cheese grater on the face scene? <laughs> <laughs> It was fun because recently, like I, I had to go back and 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 listen to a few of the sequences in the film, and um, I found out that on top of what we did with like screeching, like squelching, like vegetables and so on, then there's actually also the sound of a Tasmanian devil in there. So it has this animalistic scream, which kind of comes together with the other sounds. So it gets this, it's really like, oh my God. So <clears throat> it's this way of kind of using organic sounds, but in a very intense and very kind of upfront way. And very, in a way it's very experimental, but it's also very shocking because you don't know what hits you. Um, now, you, you mentioned the small room, and when I was doing research for this, I found that Lee, uh, the director, had said that he wanted sort of like a contained horror movie, but because it's inside, you know, you're contained within doors, but he wanted that feeling of it being vast and sort of having like a large space, but within a contained world. So I'm wondering how you did that. Um, with with the dynamics and creating that sort of feeling of being you know co contained but also giving us that fast uh world yeah so the idea was that like like in the, in this small space kind of making everything feel big uh, so you get this kind of claustrophobic feeling of being in a small space but everything is like really powerful and visceral and we did that by often for a lot of the elements in the film, we recorded something that was a bit bigger than what you actually see. So when she turns on the stove in the kitchen, 
that's actually the sound of a giant barbecue, the biggest barbecue we could find, like, yes. like really having like big sounds there for smaller things in a way, so that everything kind of becomes big. Um, but then at the same time, it was also about how we mix the film. So it's mixed in Dolby Atmos, which is this amazing surround format where you kind of like there's sound all around you, also from the ceiling. So we really played around with like having sounds envelop you constantly. And like there's it's constantly raining outside in the film. So the rain is sometimes on the side, but it's also on the, like coming from above you. The sounds um, are kind of like moving into the room. I mean, like when you open a door, it's not just like something that happens up front. It's the door like comes through the whole room. I mean, we do it from the very beginning of the film when the Warner Brothers logo comes up and kind of moves through the air, kind of moves through the whole auditorium, <laughs> kind of just, um, so everything becomes very big and physical and it feels like you're inside these locations. I mean, even when you watch through the peephole and you just see this, I mean, it's it's very, very tiny but then we make it giant, like we make it really big through the sound. So it feels like you're inside then the perspective is all distorted and sounds flow around you. So we really, we, 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 we really play around with the acoustics and we play around with the perspective and we make something that's small, like very immersive. Well, it's interesting because you, I like I, th I was thinking about the Atmos, and one of my questions was going to be like, how do you build tension with Atmos? But I guess also like we have a lot of young people who are just getting their career started watching these. So like, what would your advice be to young people who haven't experienced Atmos yet in terms of sound designing? But like from a sound designing perspective, what should they take into account? I think uh, Atmos is amazing because it creates this enveloping feeling which is very natural i mean and one thing is that atmos can be very very powerful because it's like full frequency sound all around you but it's also at the same time it it's 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 very very detailed i mean it's very precise so that you can have a sound that comes like moves all around you and really like and that can if you use that wrong or like become too kind of like sounds just like being out there for no reason at all, then it becomes too much. It can kind of become like, it can take your attention away from the screen. What is important is that a film like Evil Dead, you can tell that Lee Cronin directed this film thinking about that there was a sound world around the screen. So the sound doesn't just stop where the screen stops, the sound continues. And I think it's important when you work in Atmos to really think about like, how do we use this format? So it's not just something where, well, we have a, a 60 new channels, we can just do everything and sounds can fly all around you. It has to come from the story. And the incredible thing about Evil Dead Rise was that Lee, well, like he was thinking about sound when he wrote the script and he was thinking about like, okay, so there's so many scenes, like there's the vinyl scene where you hear like the, and these voices from the vinyl comes like from all around you. There's a scene with like, um, Ellie kind of crawling on the on above them on the on in the in the vent, and there's like like there's the book which like comes alive through sound. Uh, there's the elevator scene where Ellie is just alone in the elevator. There's no one else, and then it's just sound like pushing her around. And all of these scenes are made in a way where sound really like sound creates the story around the characters and because it's like that then atmos just feels so natural because 
the Atmos soundscape just feels like it comes out of the story. Well, it's it's interesting because when we were talking about story before, one of the things I found when I was looking at Lee's interviews um, was that he said he wanted to do exposition through sound. I was wondering if you guys had talked about that or what he sort of means by that. Yeah. So, for example, this I, mean, I mentioned the vinyls, the these records that they find in this um, vault, and they have all this these priests, this priest that is talking, and that priest talking is, I mean, he's telling you a lot of story. Like he's kind of like, it's really like a lot of kind of story points told through what he's saying but you don't really see it as like boring storytelling because it's made in a way where it's experienced through the sound so that you experience like oh you hear this voice wow this is interesting whoa and it sounds really gritty and okay what's going on what kind of place is this what kind of recording is this and oh this is really fascinating and that all those thoughts goes through the audience like mind when listening to this and it becomes really like whoa wow what's going on so all this dialogue that is really like i mean if it was a character coming in the door and then telling you all these things it would be the most boring thing ever but now it becomes like feels like very filmic it's very it's it's really creative sonic storytelling. Interesting. Now um, I'm wondering because uh, and I heard this and I don't know if it's true, so maybe you can uh, clarify it with me. But I heard that you guys vocalize some of the practical sounds. Is that true? And what does that involve? Uh, there's so many tricks in this film that I even like even I forgot half of them. But yeah, what we did was that from the beginning. Um, Lee had this idea that we should use a voice a little bit like in The Exorcist, where when the girl gets possessed, then her voice changes. And her voice changes into not something that is pitched down or like an animal or something like that. It's actually a human voice, but an, an old woman's voice. Very rusty, deep, dark, amazing voice. Mercedes McCrabridge, um, who created this unique voice in The Exorcist. And we talked about that voice from the beginning. Like, could we have somehow a voice, <coughs> a voice creating the demon's voice? And um, then I worked together with a Danish singer, Jenny Rosanda Lutmore is her name when she's on doing albums she's actually a pop singer but i knew that she could do all these crazy things with her voice so uh, we did several kind of voice recording sessions where she came in and did all these crazy things with her voice which was really amazing and one thing is that apart from like all the weird demonic screams and all of that i i thought it would be interesting if she also kind of replicated like some of the actual sounds that were made so that instead of like when when a cable in the elevator kind of breaks and it's like then instead of using an an actual sound effect for that then use her voice for that so that it even the cable is somehow possessed or like when the blood seeks into the book the book of the dead then it's not a it's the sound of any any liquid it's the sound of her her weird like a weird sound from her throat so it's these things where we use vocals instead of using actual sound effects i mean then sometimes i manipulate her voice a lot and stuff like that but it was an interesting way of kind of creating character to all these props in the film. Um, Lee has this thing where like pretty much every prop you see in the film 
later on in the film, it becomes some kind of demonic thing or like it's used in a very bloody evil way. So every prop in the film also has its own characteristic sound. So, I mean, not just the book, but also, I mean, like um, the door, I mentioned the door earlier, like um, uh, the, the, yeah, the book, the, the, the records, the, like all of these different like props that <laughs> later on in the film becomes evil the the stuff that makes evil things well now i have one last question for you what would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or tv show to watch <laughs> that's a great question <laughs> um <laughs> i've got kids like who like in i mean who uh, they are now 11 and 13 but we've been watching a lot of like um kids stuff and uh, i must say that the uh, one of i mean i don't know if that's a guilty pleasure but watching up together with them and just sitting there crying in the couch like the first 30 minutes <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's that's I mean that's one of my favorite films but then at the same time it's just like my kids are always like dad what is happening to you while I'm sitting there with tears in my eyes <laughs> um but um yeah so so that's a lot of the guilty pleasures around here has been like really watching kids stuff um but I also then at the same time I there's there's quite a lot of good kids stuff out there so i don't know if it's a guilty pleasure or not but um uh, i actually like watching bad movies sometimes and it's it's i feel this thing where i mean this for some people for some film lovers it's like either you watch really intellectual stuff and then over here it's all the popcorn stuff and I'm always like, I want to be able to watch, I mean, uh, an, uh, a Brazilian avant-garde movie. And then mm -hmm. the next movie I'll watch will be Transformers or something. I've always yeah. been like that, kind of like stealing tricks from both popcorn movies and abstract art movies. I yeah. really love going back and forth between them. And I think we, I mean... I love that kind of inspiration where you can just, I mean, get inspired by um, Terrence Malick and Michael Bay. I mean, it, it's it's like the the limits to where you can get inspiration is only in your in your brain. I mean, I really I really love watching sometimes watching some horrible movies and then getting some wonderful ideas from that. Any any ideas that you've you've taken that you're really uh, you know proud of that you can let us know about? Um, I, I actually like while we were mixing the film, we um, it was while the Northman was playing in the cinema in Copenhagen, and we went out to watch it, and I really enjoyed that film, a crazy film, crazy epic like just over the top movie but it had so much like really creative sound design and there was there were these kind of like weird abstract sequences where it almost felt like you were inside the belly of someone or like it was like almost like inside a human being somehow mm -hmm. and that was where i got the idea that there's a scene in the film where where ellie the the mother kind of like suddenly can hear that there's a little baby inside of Beth's belly. Oh, interesting. That idea came from watching the Northman, and then I remembered I, I recorded this the the sound of my son's heart while he was inside his mother's inside his mother like 
10, 15 years ago. And I used that sound for that moment. So now he's a famous... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, now my son is a part of Evil Dead Rise. Yeah, exactly. He's, I'm proud of that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for letting me interview you this week. Thank you. It was a pleasure being part of this. And that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs.